Welcome everyone to this uh, conference on the land of lakes and its legacy. We want, I want to thank each and every one of you for being with us, for attending here. Particular thanks to the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and its director, Kathy Cummings, for sponsoring this conference. Kathy will speak to you in just a moment. I extend my personal thanks to my colleagues, the presidents of other Catholic universities, for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us. They'll be introduced soon. I know how demanding their schedules are, and I am very grateful to each of them for taking time to come and spend time with us. A distinguished philosopher from Notre Dame, now emeritus, Alistair McIntyre, who once wrote, and I'm paraphrasing roughly, so I hope he's not here so to me to, to slaughter his words, but uh, he said universities are institutions one of whose central activity is to debate what their central activity is. That is true of any university, but particularly institutions that have a rich commitment to faith and the Catholic intellectual tradition that Catholic universities have. Reflection and discussion about our activities and purposes is not a sign of weakness or confusion. confusion I think it's a sign of strength and health. That was what the Land of Lakes statement attempted to do 50 years ago, and it is a conversation we continue here today as we discuss the legacy of that document. I thank you for being part of this effort. I look forward to the discussion, and now I will call Kathy Cummings up to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Father John, and thank you all for coming. As Father John said, my name is Kathleen Cummings. I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and a faculty member in the Departments of History and American Studies here at Notre Dame. Now, as many of you know, I see a lot of our regulars in the audience, and you know that the Kushwa Center regularly sponsors research, lectures, and conferences that deal with the American Catholic historical experience. We believe that the study of the past always helps us interpret the present and imagine the future. But there are times, however, when we partner with colleagues on campus and beyond to make those connections a bit more explicit. And I'm absolutely delighted that this is one of those occasions. It's been a privilege for the Kushwa Center to collaborate with Notre Dame's Office of the President and to work in partnership with the presidents of other Catholic universities. And I'd like to just acknowledge them briefly now and thank them for taking time out of our, their busy schedules to join us. Father William Leahy, president of Boston College, President Patricia McGuire of Trinity Washington University, Father Joseph McShane of Fordham University, Dr. Julie Sullivan, President of the University of St. Thomas, and Jan Cervelli, President of St. Mary's College. It's a pleasure to have you all with us, and we look forward to hearing your reflections later on this evening. This, as you know, is conceived as a two-pronged event. Um, tonight will be more of a look into the future, a chance to hear the panelists speak on the Land of Lakes statement and its strengths, weaknesses, and ongoing relevance for our teaching, our learning, and our research. This afternoon's session is intended to be more of a look backward to the broader context in which Land of Lakes was crafted. In 1967, 50 years ago, Father Theodore M. Hesburgh was at the time president not only of Notre Dame, but also of the International Federation of Catholic Universities. He invited a group of Catholic university administrators, leaders of religious communities, bishops and scholars to Land O'Lakes, Wisconsin to draft a statement on Catholic higher age education that came to be known as the Land O'Lakes Statement. This document was one of a number of preparatory reports from around the world that lay the groundwork for an international meeting of Catholic university leaders and Vatican officials in 1968. The Land O'Lakes Statement, however, itself became a watershed document for Catholic higher education in the United States. In seeking to renew their institutions in a post-Vatican II context, its authors foregrounded the need for academic freedom and institutional autonomy alongside certain distinctive features that Catholic universities would carry forward in a modern context, including commitments to theological education, student formation, and Christian service. There is no, better, no person better poised to help situate Land O'Lakes in historical context than Notre Dame's own John T. McGreevy, professor of history and the I.A. O'Shaughnessy Dean of the College of Arts and Letters. After graduating from Notre Dame with a bachelor's in history, 
Dean McGreevy earned his master's and PhD from Stanford University, joined the faculty of Harvard, and returned to Notre Dame as associate professor of history. He served as chair of the history department from 2002 until 2008 when he was appointed dean. John McGreevy has received fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Louisville Institute, and the Erasmus Institute. And he's published numerous articles and reviews in the Journal of American History, Commonweal, The New Republic, The New York Review of Books, and many other venues. His teaching and research interests focus on American political and religious history. His first book, Parish Boundaries, The Catholic Encounter with Race in the 20th Century Urban North, won the 1996 John Gilmary Shea Prize for the best book on Catholic history from the American Catholic Historical Association. His 2003 book, Catholicism and American Freedom, A History, narrates the interplay between Catholicism and liberalism in American intellectual life. The New York Times called it a brilliant book which brings historical analysis of religion and American culture to a new level of insight and importance. Dean McGreevy's third and most recent book was published in 2016 with Princeton University Press and is titled American Jesuits and the World, How an Embattled Religious Order Made Modern Catholicism Global. Dean McGreevy has agreed to take a few questions before we adjourn this afternoon at 5 p.m., but he will rejoin our discussion later this evening. We've asked him to speak primarily as a historian of US Catholicism to help us situate the Land O'Lakes meeting in its context, but of course he also brings practical experience and vision to the table, having served as college dean for almost 10 years. We stand to benefit on multiple levels uh, from what he and the panelists have to share with, that, with us. Please join me in welcoming Dean John McGreevy. It's late July in a far corner of northern Wisconsin called Land of Lakes, which required a special flight on a prop plane from O'Hare. There's no air conditioning. It's a site best known as a place to do scientific research on mosquitoes. <laughs> it's a wonder, actually, that anybody came. But five college presidents, two bishops, and 19 other Catholic higher education administrators and intellectuals did. And after three days of work and to a coordinated publicity drumbeat, they released the Land of Lake Statement on July 23, 1967. So there's the group. There they are hard at work. You'll notice if you scrutinize this photograph carefully, the tape recorder in the middle of the table there. Our Land of Lakes version of Rosemary Woods and the missing 17-minute Watergate tape is our hunt for the tape made at that meeting. The tape may exist at the headquarters of the International Federation of Catholic Universities in Paris, and of course, I think I'll need to fly there personally to investigate. <laughs> when I inquired in the first week of August after first seeing this photograph, I was told in very fine French fashion that the office would be closed for the entire month of August and the first two weeks of September, but when the office reopens, we'll see if the tapes exist there. Okay, our shared task is to reflect on the statement, Land Lakes, on this, its 50th anniversary. I win no profile in courage by suggesting that a superb place to begin that reflection is the July 11th issue of America, with an article written by my boss's boss, Father John Jenkins. But it is nonetheless true. I add for the record and for any human resources staff or present that I agree with every word in Father Jenkins' article, <laughs> including every the and every and. I'll end by suggesting what I see as Father Jenkins' most significant insight. But first, I'll suggest three contexts that inform the meeting and what they might mean for the document's interpretation. All the delegates were men. So you see, a fact ignored at the time and only partially explained by an explicit focus on the larger Catholic universities, again, all led then by men. The guiding visionary was Notre Dame's Father Theodore Hesburgh, then entering the 16th year of a 35-year presidency. Already a figure of international visibility, Hesburgh's energy and charisma had propelled him to not only a university presidency, but leadership on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission and the upper ranks of papal diplomacy. But he was not alone. The surviving documents suggest that Hesburgh was closely allied with Father Paul Reiner, St. Louis University's president, and a leader in the Jesuit network that then and now set much of the tone in American Catholic higher education. 
Also in attendance was a young future cardinal, Theodore McCarrick, then rector of the Catholic University in Puerto Rico. The most important context for Land of Lakes was what Kathy alluded to, the just completed Second Vatican Council. Formally, the Land of Lakes meeting occurred because of a request by the International Federation of Catholic Universities, located in Paris, to reassess Catholic education in light of the Council. Hesburgh had become president of the International Federation of Catholic Universities, which was then effectively defunct in 1963, and overcoming the resistance of Vatican officials, but with the vigorous support of Pope Paul VI, had reorganized it into a vehicle for discussion of problems facing Catholic universities around the world. The title of the Land of Lakes meeting, the formal title, The Nature and Mission of the Catholic University in the Modern World, echoed the title of Gaudium et Spes, the 1965 conciliar document on the church in the modern world. So nature and mission of the Catholic University in the modern world, the church in the modern world. Hesburgh consciously saw Land of Lakes as an explication of Gaudium et Spes since the conciliar document had only, quote, 15 lines on universities, end quote. Hesburgh's speeches in the period just before the meeting urged Catholic institutions to, quote, be much in the world as leaven or light, end quote. This broad push for engagement with modern society included a more open attitude toward alliances with men and women of other faiths, notably Protestants and Jews. During these years, Hesburgh frequently spoke about the importance of the ecumenical movement and cheerfully authored a short tribute to Martin Luther. Working directly with Paul VI, he arranged for Notre Dame to run an ecumenical institute in Jerusalem expressly charged with fostering dialogue between Catholics and other Christians. That's one context. A second context, that is the Second Vatican Council, a second context was university and faculty governance. Hesburgh arrived at Land of Lakes having orchestrated only weeks before a governance revolution shifting ownership of Notre Dame away from the Congregation of Holy Cross to a lay-led board of trustees. As the phrasing in the initial press release for that decision explained, Notre Dame had moved, quote, from exclusively clerical to predominantly lay control, end quote. Now, St. Louis University, led by Father Reinert, had just preceded Notre Dame in the shift to a lay board, and eventually, almost every American Catholic university or college soon followed. The origins of that governance decision, too, lay in Gaudium et Spes and the stress on the vocation of all baptized Christians, not only vowed religious. A gathering of Catholic educators in Rome, attended by Hesburgh just a few months before Land of Lakes, had included a speech by Yves Congar, one of the most influential theologians at the council, on precisely this issue, the need for lay clerical cooperation in the management and running of Catholic universities. Allied to this conciliar vision were pragmatic convictions, that the governance of increasingly complex institutions had outrun the capacity of men and women in religious orders, that successful fundraising depended upon deeper forms of collaboration, we should dwell for a moment on the generosity and confidence inherent in this decision, a transfer of formal authority unusual in the history of higher education. This transfer was not total. The president of Notre Dame, for example, was required to be a Holy Cross priest, and a body of fellows within the Board of Trustees, half lay, half Holy Cross, was charged with, quote, maintaining the essential character of the university as a Catholic institution, end quote. But it was a transfer, a calculated bet, as Hesburg put it, on, quote, granting the laity a more independent and responsible role in the governance of Catholic institutions. Lay boards of trustees, lay boards of trustees, and a sense of collaboration also implied faculty governance. The same year, Hesburg inaugurated a faculty senate and the new university trustees set to work on developing formal measures for faculty consultation in appointments and tenure and promotion. Now, Hesburgh's enthusiasm for faculty governance, like perhaps that of other university presidents then and now, was understandably less robust than his support for a lay board. But even tentative steps marked a decisive shift away from the early 20th century mode of university presidents simply appointing faculty and administrators. 
This discussion of lay leadership and faculty governance occurred in the late 1960s alongside strikes and work stoppages at institutions such as, as varied as Dayton, St. John's, and Catholic University. Crises prompted either because of Episcopal interventions and faculty appointments, a topic I'll get back to in a second, or perceptions of inadequate faculty participation in university decision making. That's the second context, faculty, governments, lay board, faculty governance and lay board trustees. A third context is globalization. Attended by bishops and delegates from all over the world, the council was one of the 20th century's most global events. The emergence of a world church in ways unknown since late antiquity. So too, in its way, Land of Lakes. Recall that Land of Lakes was only the North American discussion of the future of Catholic colleges and universities. Other discussions, all coordinated, even manipulated by Hesburgh, occurred in Colombia, Manila, and Paris. Recognizing these three contexts, the Second Vatican Council on Gaudium et Spes, lay leadership and faculty governance, a more global church, should cast doubt on one criticism associated with Land of Lakes, that its authors understood a diminishment of Catholic identity as a necessary step to compete with or mindlessly imitate Bowdoin, UCLA, and Northwestern. Quite the opposite. The authors saw themselves as fostering and forging a deeper Catholic identity, one predicated on shared responsibility and penetrating more effectively into both the classroom and student life. The authors did want to distance themselves and the Catholic University from, in their minds, clumsy and inappropriate attempts at ecclesiastical control. Hesburgh had endured one such intervention from the Holy Office in Rome in the 1950s, as Father Jenkins reminds us in his article. The one university president who publicly dissented from Land of Lakes, Catholic University's rector, William McDonald, had recently forbidden a speaker series at Catholic University with a list of speakers that included John Courtney Murray and Hans Kung and other luminaries at the Second Vatican Council, and he did so at the express but secret wish of the apostolic delegate to the United States. The result was a predictable outcry, and McDonald's censorship and the attendant negative publicity dismayed many of the cardinals on the Catholic University board, notably Albert Meyer from Chicago and Joseph Ritter from St. Louis. Their view was simple, and I think echoed by Hesburgh and other people at Land of Lakes, that such ecclesial interventions weakened the reputation of the university as a place of serious inquiry. In one of the preparatory papers for the meeting, the great church historian John, Ell John Tracy Ellis worried that bishops would antagonize Catholic academics newly committed to academic freedom. So, while they worried about Episcopal efforts at control, the authors of Lands of Land of Lakes still wished to have, quote, Catholicism perceptively present, unquote, in all facets of university life. This new phase in Catholic university history seemed to them a natural renewal of institutions begun in far different circumstances. Just as the council had transformed church teaching on the Jewish people and other non-Christians and had inaugurated a new vision of religious freedom, so too did Catholic universities require charters consonant with the best university practices in the mid-20th century. In this sense, the Second Vatican Council is the origin of a discussion that continued at Land of Lakes, that continued again with Ex Corde Ecclesiae, the 1990 Apostolic Constitution, and continues today. It tries to imagine how Catholic institutions might flourish in a new era. But was this imagination adequate? An immediate objection might be that the authors of Land of Lakes may have understood themselves to be deepening Catholic identity and institutional excellence. But the gap between their intentions and subsequent reality led to secularization. It's a reasonable argument. When the authors of Land of Lakes forecast large numbers of vowed religious playing a role in many academic departments, they did not anticipate the crisis that would soon grip religious life as vocations plunged and departures from men's and women's religious orders accelerated. One Catholic university president at the meeting left the priesthood just three years later. This exodus eventually stabilized, but modest recruitment numbers and institutional growth on the part of colleges and universities ensured that vowed religious would steadily become less visible on Catholic campuses over time, a trend that alarmed even sympathetic non-Catholic observers and put even more pressure on the importance of lay understanding of particular religious charisms. 
the authors of Land of Lakes could see, but not fully grasp, the impact of continued Catholic assimilation into American society. Did it matter, for example, that the percentage of Catholic students at University of Illinois, Chicago, was only slightly less than the percentage of Catholic students at DePaul? Similarly, what would Catholic identity mean for faculty, many not Catholic and many more never having worked or studied at a Catholic institution? These faculty were almost instinctively loyal, maybe more loyal, to the disciplines in which they were trained than the institutions at which they worked. Neither could the authors foresee a recent dramatic uptick in young people with not only a minimal religious background, but an unprecedented willingness to abandon that background once freed of parental influence. Now, I said the strongest criticisms of Land of Lakes are reasonable. I did not say they're convincing. Land of Lakes insists that Catholic institutions must engage the world and that this larger sense of engagement derives from Gaudium et Spes. Viewed 50 years later, a focus on engagement, not capitulation, has aged well. Engagement presumes that the modern world, including the modern research university, is fundamentally good and worthy of such engagement. And it presumes that Catholic universities might both offer something to this world and learn from it. Not everyone agrees with these assumptions, and prominent voices have urged Catholics to retreat from a putatively decadent American culture or to view themselves as strangers in a strange land. Hesburgh and Reinhardt had neither that desire nor that luxury. In 1967, as Hesburgh well knew, not a single Catholic university ranked even close to the upper tier in terms of graduate program reputation. Not a single Catholic university was in the top 100 for endowment. Faculty at Catholic universities were significantly underrepresented in national awards and fellowships. Their salaries were uniformly low. The financial struggles of Catholic colleges in the late 1960s were not those of today. And for the presence in the audience, I can say that Fathers Hesburgh and Reinhardt did not lose sleep over their tuition discount rate. But even they thought tuition in the late 1960s was fantastically high. And even they knew that, thri that now thriving Catholic institutions such as Boston College were in imminent danger of closing in the late 60s and early 70s. For all those reasons then, absorbing the best practices of secular colleges and universities seemed crucial. Smart outside observers in the late 1960s were predicting that the most talented and ambitious Catholic undergraduates would soon no longer attend Notre Dame or Boston College or Fordham or St. Thomas or Trinity. Instead, they would flock to Harvard, Williams, Michigan, and Stanford. Indeed, the same pattern already seemed to be happening with the most talented lay Catholic faculty. Mediocrity then, not secularization, seemed to Hesburgh and Reinhardt their biggest obstacle. And they dedicated their careers to achieving academic excellence precisely because such excellence was the best long-term strategy to assist the church. And so it is proved. The only Catholic college or university I know well is Notre Dame, but it's easy to demonstrate that Notre Dame is more intentional and more successful in sustaining a small C and big C Catholic identity today than it was in 1967, flat out. More faculty and students of all faith backgrounds and none identify with the mission of the university and more programs that are built and sustained because of it. Retreating from this successful commitment to engagement seems implausible now, certainly for Catholic research universities. This focus on engagement also seems the only moral alter alternative in a nation where Catholics constitute a full 20% of the population and are as numerous in Congress, on corporate boards, and other leadership sectors as any other religious group. In this sense, Gaudium et Spes, and on a much more modest scale, Land of Lakes, marked for modern Catholicism an acknowledgement of responsibility for societies Catholics themselves had helped create. Land of Lakes got right to the idea that a Catholic university's engagement with the world must include engagement with what was then called the Third World, but what we might now term the Global South. Only in the 1970s, not during the putatively more orthodox era before the Council, did Catholic universities push to the forefront of student and faculty programs in human rights, development, and related issues. Hesburgh, in fact, spent much of 1967 and 1968 working on conferences and events to mark the 20th anniversary 
of the UN Declaration on Human Rights. Part of that global engagement was explicitly theological, theological, what the Notre Dame mission statement now terms, quote, cultivating a disciplined sensibility to the poverty, injustice, and oppression that burden the lives of so many, end quote. In the 1980s, bishops, presidents, and scholars, some in this room, wrangled over ensuring orthodoxy among Catholic theologians. What they took for granted by the 1980s was not taken for granted in the 1960s. The idea that Catholic college students should receive theological training, which before the council had really been limited to seminarians. Now, of course, all colleges and universities, not just Catholic institutions, are more self-consciously global now than they were in 1967 of necessity. But there are distinctive Catholic versions of globalization. To mention just one example upon which I'm sure our presidents can talk about this evening and which comes to mind because of this morning's headlines, the ongoing Latino migration to the United States is the largest demographic shift of the post-war era and also, of course, a largely Catholic population. How Catholic institutions founded by European immigrants in the 19th century welcome, absorb, and transform themselves for the children and grandchildren of these Latino migrants surely constitutes our first and perhaps most important 21st century Catholic identity test. To repeat my main point, the optimism of the Land of Lakes authors was buoyant but not naive, focused on engagement as a theological and practical strategy, not as a capitulation to the world. This insight is elegantly restated by Father Jenkins, who stresses the harmony of faith of reason and the desirability of a church acting in the world as opposed to a sect withdrawing from it. Our, in this room, 19th century predecessors chose to found colleges and universities when they might have done many other things. Father Hesburgh, Father Reinhardt, and their allies, lay and religious, chose to renew them, convinced that Catholic colleges and universities need a new foundation if they were to nourish souls in better society. The Land of Lakes document itself, if you had a chance to read it, is, I think, of modest significance. It's a few pages drafted over a couple days. It's more aspirational than detailed. It's hazy about what Catholic intellectual life might mean and what Catholic institutions might do beyond required courses in theology and philosophy. Were they in this room, I think, the authors, these people up here, might cheerfully concede these weaknesses and propose another retreat at Land of Lakes to discuss them. They recognize Catholic higher education as an experiment, one able to draw on rich intellectual resources, but also continually in need of testing and refinement. What would please them, and what we are about this afternoon and this evening, is testing and strengthening that vision for our own time. Thank you.